Today in our service, we hear two stories about men who ploughed. And remember that this is the end of Refugee Week in Scotland. Let the earth acclaim God. Sing to the glory of God's name. Come and see what God has done. Let the sound of praise be heard. Blessed be God, who has not withdrawn from us love and care. Our Psalm of the Week, Psalm 16, is sometimes called the Golden Psalm. It is so encouraging and uplifting. Probably written around 539 BCE, as the Israelites started returning to their homeland after the exile, it acknowledges God as a good provider and counsellor. Psalm 16 Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord's always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to show or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures for evermore. Blessed be the name of the Lord now and for evermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the Lord's name be praised. Let us pray. Worthy of praise from every mouth, of confession from every tongue, of worship from every creature, is your glorious name, Creator, Son and Holy Spirit, one God for ever. You created the world in your grace, and by your compassion you redeemed it. Heaven and earth are full of your praises. Glory be to you, O God Most High. Angels and archangels and all the hosts of heaven worship you. Accept the praises of us, your earthly servants, in this house and throughout the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gracious parent, your might is beyond measure, your wisdom beyond knowledge, your love beyond all telling. You have put eternity into our hearts and made us hunger and thirst for you. Satisfy the longings you have implanted that we may find you in life and find life in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. But merciful Sovereign, we are not fit subjects of your rule. You have shown us the ways of love and forgiveness, but sometimes we turn back to ways of pride and hatred. We are more ready to denounce your enemies than to declare the good news. We delay obedience to your call with excuses of personal privilege. Forgive our fitful discipleship and our outright disobedience for Jesus' sake. Hear the good news. Freedom in Christ has set us free. Through the spirit of faith we wait for the hope of righteousness. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. God of love, your Son gave us a new commandment that we should love one another, even as you love us, the unworthy and the wandering. Give us minds forgetful of past ill will and hearts to love one another, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and for evermore. Amen.
reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 to 16, and verses 19 to 21. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. There you will get and anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Isha, son of Shapha, from Abdel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha's son of Shapha. He was ploughing the twelve yoke of ox, oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the ploughing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. At the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead. They went into a Samaritan village and to get ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus replied. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But that man replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the, the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Got your holidays booked yet? How are you getting there? Did you choose the, the quickest way, the shortest way, or maybe the, the scenic route? I suppose the answer depends on where you're going and your means of transport. In this reading from Luke's Gospel, we find Jesus is in Galilee. He is heading for Jerusalem and is set on getting there quickly. So much so, that he is choosing to avoid the usual route across the Jordan by get going straight through Samaria. Now, the Samaritans were never going to put the bunting out for Jesus or his disciples or for any Jew, for that matter. This intense hostility went back centuries. It didn't hinder Jesus. He sent folk ahead to secure food and shelter. When this friendly request was denied, James and John lived up to their nicknames, the Sons of Thunder. They cheerfully volunteered to lay waste to the people and their town. They just felt it was the proper thing to do. Instead, what the story gives us is a supreme example of the kind of behaviour Jesus expects from us. Tolerance. Tolerance. Today, sadly, it seems impossible simply to agree to disagree about any subject. There is no middle ground, no shading of opinion. It's either us or them. I'm right. You, on the other hand, have nothing of worth to say. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote... I have no more right to object to a man holding a different opinion from mine than I have to differ from a man because he wears a wig 
and I wear my own hair. I have resolved to use every possible method of preventing a narrowness of spirit, a party zeal, that miserable bigotry which makes so many ready, unready to believe that there is any work of God but among themselves. Almost certainly, the one thing that has caused more suffering and disruption than almost anything else is the certainty that our beliefs and our methods are alone the only correct ones. Many years ago, I remember vividly a minister in Wollaston Church in Dundee saying that if we worshipped only those with whom we agreed completely, the congregation could easily fit in the phone boxes in the city square. And there were, if I remember correctly, six of them at that time. God has his root into every heart. It will vary with time and place and person. God fulfills his purpose in many ways. There is no one person, there is no one church, large or small, ancient or modern, who has a monopoly on the truth of God. We do well to bear in mind that wonderful invitation to the Lord's table. Let all who love the Lord come here. When we deal with others, we must follow this great example of, to of the tolerance of Jesus. It is equally important, though, that this tolerance is, is not because we couldn't care less or because we are indifferent to others. Our tolerance must be based on love for others. When we look at others, they must not see a, a vacant stare but the eyes of loving care. When we find someone who has made a mistake or has found to be wrong or, or lost in some way, we must regard them as a friend who has strayed. Abraham Lincoln was once accused of being too generous to his enemies. He was advised to destroy them completely. His answer, do I not destroy my enemies? when I make them my friends. Forgiveness and friendship a recovery led by love. Not an easy option, but Jesus was clear about that. Following him was never going to be a life of ease and wealth. Luke 9 verse 57. A man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. The reply of Jesus effectively was, before you follow me, count the cost. No one can ever say that they were persuaded to follow Jesus because of a false promise. For anyone wishing to follow him, Jesus could not have set the bar higher. To achieve the goal which Jesus sets us, is not without effort and difficulty, but it is a goal which would make a lasting and real difference to the world in which we live. To start a dialogue which is one of understanding and respect, to bring to an intolerant and divided world a message of love, of peace, of service. The second man whom Jesus calls replies that he would follow Jesus after he has buried his father. This was, and, and apparently still is, a not uncommon expression in the Middle East. It is quite probable that the man's father was not actually dead and not likely to be so for, for some time. The point Jesus was making is that in everything there is a crucial moment. If that time has passed, that thing may never get done. The man 
in the story, knew in his heart that he should be following Jesus, but his commitments were holding him back. Psychologists tell us that when we have a desire to act and we put it off, the less likely we are to do it. The delay becomes a substitute for the action. A letter of thanks, an email of congratulation, a phone call of consolation, postponed until tomorrow, becomes just something else to do later or never. Jesus asks us to respond to what is in our heart, to recognise that crucial moment and to act on it. The third man promised to follow Jesus, but again asked for time to go back to his family. In his reply, Jesus uses an example drawn straight from life. The first janitor I had at school had been brought up on a farm which was just about as remote as you can get. As a result, every autumn he would spend his Sundays driving to ploughing competitions. The next day, he would stop me as, as I entered the, the playground. Normally, a quiet, shy chap, he would relate in great detail the preparation, the effort and the concentration needed to maintain a plough in a straight line out over a field full of bumps and slopes. Almost as inevitably he would finish with a wee anecdote about his childhood. A lovely moment and then he would get on with his week's work. No one can ever plough a straight line looking over their shoulder all the time and no one can go through life looking backwards all the time. We cannot spend our time thinking of what used to be. To that third man, Jesus did not say either follow or go away. He gave a simple everyday example, an example that could be understood by everybody. Then he left the man to make up his own mind. As Christians, we are called to walk not towards the sunset, but the glories of the coming morning. To walk with friendship, with tolerance and with forgiveness, and with love, to the dawning of a new day with Jesus. Amen.
A troubled world, hurting people. We bring them now before God in our prayers for others. Let us pray. Holy God, you have called us to pray together and here we are. Loving God, you care for all your children. You know each one and hear each prayer. You know each house and see each need. Give peace and love to those who call upon you and receive us into the kingdom of your light. We pray for those called to lay and ordain ministry in your church, and for those at present testing their vocation. We lay before you the work that needs done in our churches, and ask you to provide people to do it. We ask in Jesus' name, give us grace to discern your answer. We pray for those called to serve you in positions of authority and influence. We ask that all leaders see true greatness as service and true strength as humility. We think especially of the crisis in our country just now and ask that somehow compassion and wise governing would prevail. We ask in Jesus' name, give us grace to discern your answer. We pray for those whose lives are full of disappointment, disillusion and discontent. For all who struggle with great perseverance in difficult circumstances. We pray for your strength, encouragement and direction. We ask in Jesus' name, give us grace to discern your answer. We pray for those called through death into eternal life and freedom from all their pain and suffering. Receive them with mercy and welcome them into your kingdom. We remember those left behind, grieving families and friends. We ask that they would know you near. We ask in Jesus' name, give us grace to discern your answer. And today, at the end of Refugee Week, we pray, Merciful God, we pray for all those whose desperation leads them to the sea, often after dangerous journeys over land. We pray for those escaping brutal wars, those fleeing religious persecution, those escaping climate disasters and economic ruin, those looking for hope in a hopeless situation. May we look beyond our own fears and concerns to the needs of those who have nothing, risk everything and depend on the kindness of strangers. May our hearts be opened, our leaders challenged and our self-interest called out. We thank you, Holy God, for your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you will grant their requests. Merciful God, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, it's been a privilege to share worship with you. This week, may we give our very selves to God, a living sacrifice, dedicated to telling out God's purpose for the world, that there might be love and acceptance for all. And now a blessing. The guarding of the God of life be on us. The guarding of the loving Christ be on us. The guarding of the Holy Spirit be on us. Every day and night to aid us and enfold us. Each day, each night and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.